Hello again. In the previous videos, we've explained how seasonal forecasts are produced, analysed and presented. In this final section, scientist Jessica Stacey from the International Climate Services team will tell us about where to access seasonal forecasts, the role different organisations play in the creation and communication of seasonal forecasts, and finally, two Met Office scientists will talk about projects that they've been involved in to develop seasonal forecast services. First things first, though, uh, with Jess here. Um, how can people start, where should people look to, to access seasonal forecasts? Yeah, a good place to start would be to contact your own National Met Service, also referred to as a National Meteorological and Hydrological Service, who can provide you with weather, climate and sometimes hydrology information for your country. The role of a National Met Service can vary significantly from country to country, Typically, they produce daily weather forecasts and are responsible for collecting and archiving weather observations. A growing number of Met Service provide seasonal forecasts and some even work alongside customers to co-produce seasonal products and services. Some National Met Services, including the Met Office, have the capacity to produce their own seasonal forecasts by running models on high-performance supercomputers, as we discussed earlier in part two of the video. These centres are known as Global Producing Centres, also known as GPCs, and the seasonal forecasts they produce are usually made freely available on their own websites. You mentioned there, Jess, that back in part two, we, we discovered that there are 13 GPCs around the globe. That's a lot of information. Is there anywhere you can go where all that information is in one place? Yes, well, fortunately, there are various online portals that we can access to easily look at different seasonal forecasts and also to compare all of the different models. The portals we recommend using are the IRI Data Portal, the Copernicus Climate Data Store, and the World Meteorological Organization, or WMO, Lead Center. Both the Copernicus and WMO Lead Centre portals even combine some of these models to make their own multi-model ensemble forecast. Regional climate centres are another important part of the Science Services seasonal forecast chain. These have been established in many regions of the world by the WMO to provide support to all the national MET services in the countries within that region. They are either hosted at a national MET service or formed from a network of organisations across a region. In South Asia, the Regional Climate Centre is the India Meteorological Department. Regional climate centres have defined roles within the WMO framework, including building regional climate services and coordinating regional climate outlook forums. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about these forums? Yeah, so the Regional Climate Outlook Forums are commonly abbreviated to ARCOFs, and they started in the late 1990s. They typically bring together national, regional and international climate experts to co-produce a consolidated seasonal forecast for the region. This is done by assessing the different seasonal forecast output that we've been discussing through this video. In the tropics, ARCOFs usually occur twice a year, typically some weeks ahead of the rainy season. An example is the South Asian Seasonal Climate Outlook Forum, known as SASCOF. As well as producing the regional seasonal forecast, ARCOFs often have training and capacity building workshops for meteorologists in the region. They also provide an opportunity for forecast providers to interact with decision makers using the seasonal forecasts. Sharing information helps the forecast providers understand the implications of the seasonal outlooks on different socio-economic sectors, such as agriculture, energy and water resources. Following the ARCOF, most countries in the region hold National Climate Outlook Forums, also known as ENCOFs. Usually this will involve adapting the regional seasonal forecast produced in the ARCOF to make it more country focused, as well as engaging with user communities to reach a wide range of stakeholders. Thanks very much, Jess. There's always been a great interest in forecasts on seasonal timescales, as it's important for planning decisions in key government sectors, industry, and for individuals such as farmers. Here at the Met Office, we are working to increase the use and effectiveness of seasonal forecasts through the process of co-production. We work with organisations and end users to strengthen the science to services chain. Now let's hear of examples from a couple of Met Office scientists on work they've been doing. 
Catherine Hall is from the International Development Team and has been involved in work in Africa. Seasonal forecasts have been used in parts of Africa for decades. The Met Office works closely with many organizations in the region to co-produce actionable seasonal forecasts for different sectors. Scientists from the Met Office regularly run seasonal forecast training workshops for both producers and end users. One example of how seasonal forecasts have added value occurred in West Africa. The Regional Climate Center issued the regional forecast ahead of the rainy season. This highlighted an enhanced risk of wet conditions. In response, the Red Cross increased their emergency stocks. Widespread heavy flooding then affected much of the region. Having the advanced warning meant that the Red Cross were well prepared to help those in need. Next, we hear from scientist Dr. Philip Bett, who has been working on a project in China. For the last few years, we've been working on a project to develop seasonal forecast services in China. Alongside organisations in the region, we've co-produced a forecast service for the Yangtze River Basin, providing information on the likelihood of the summer being wetter or drier than average. Our colleagues at the China Meteorological Administration use it to communicate these risks to stakeholders along the river, such as at the Three Gorges Dam. They can then use the forecast to support decisions on how much water to release from the dam before and during the season. This, in turn, helps to ensure that there is enough water to produce hydroelectric power, but also reduces the risk from flooding to cities and farmland downstream. As we've discussed in this video, there is a wealth of seasonal forecast information available, but it can be tricky to fully understand, even for the experts. If you are new to using seasonal forecasts, we recommend contacting your National Meteorological Service who may be able to recommend the most appropriate information and provide guidance on how to interpret it for applications in your own decisions. They may also be interested to get an insight into your operations and how you think seasonal forecasts can help you. Over time, two-way communication may even open up opportunities to co-develop bespoke seasonal forecasts tailored to your requirements, like the examples given, allowing you to translate seasonal forecast information directly into an action plan. So, to recap, for part four, we've learned that seasonal forecasts can be accessed either through global producing center websites or via online portals such as the WMO, Copernicus and IRI portals. Regional and national climate outlook forums bring together climate experts and decision makers to produce a seasonal forecast whilst promoting its uptake and usability. And finally, we looked at examples of how seasonal forecasts are being successfully implemented into long-term planning strategies. This brings us to the end of this series of videos, which has stepped through the seasonal forecast process, from the science to the production, analysis, and finally the development of services. All elements within this process are continually evolving, including the science that goes into improving the models and the way in which forecasts are communicated. Despite this, seasonal forecasts will always have their limitations and should be interpreted with caution. Decisions based on seasonal forecasts should also be reviewed alongside forecasts with shorter lead times as they become available. Sub-seasonal forecasts are usually available with a one-month lead time and weather forecasts should always be monitored for details on day-to-day -day variability. When seasonal forecasts are used appropriately, they can provide valuable information to support risk-based decision-making and reduce the impacts of climate extremes. We really hope you found these videos useful. And for more information about seasonal forecasting and the range of work we're doing with partners in the UK and around the world, please visit the Met Office website.